Uh, replay, make sure to skip to 10 minutes, because that's what I'm actually going to be uh, narrating. This is just kind of a wait for people to show up screen. So. But, uh, another lit RPG title. Had so much fun doing the Selfless Hero Trilogy, or William D. Arend. And I figured I'd uh, stick around with the genre, see what else is going on with it, because I really enjoyed doing the Selfless Hero trilogy. And I thought, um, I thought the concept was cool. I thought I kind of fit the genre quite well, because I love video games, I play video games all the time, and uh, I want to get into the industry anyway. So I figure it's a good audience for me. Maybe if I get into the ears of enough uh, lit RPG listeners, they might start writing their favorite video ga game companies telling them that they need to hire me. Oh yeah, the uh, mind versus mind. Stop <clears throat> in. Good seeing ya. Um. Well, I just uh, recorded. Uh, Danny asks, have you ever tried voice acting in video games before? I haven't done any paid work, <laughs> but um, I uh, I just did a voice for a guy who did a Skyrim mod. Hey, Blaze. Um, I played David Bowie as Jareth. <laughs> for he he made a he made a follower for Skyrim, so. Um, yeah, I did. I did the David Bowie voice voice for him, and I can't wait for him to finish it and get it on there, get it updated. Go download his mod. It's called Jareth Follower. If you play Skyrim, and then I'm sure he'll update it as soon as he's got all the voice done, voice integrated into it. It's. Uh, I'm gonna like as soon as it's there. I'm gonna get on my Skyrim game, and I'm gonna go find that follower, and it's gonna be weird have myself following me around but it, hopefully it won't sound like me, me hopefully it will just sound like Jared I plan to do more he did the he did uh, the entire fellowship of the ring as followers so I'm gonna be doing all those voices as well as soon as he gets me the scripts Maybe I'll uh, actually record the Fellowship of the Ring for a special edition of Sound Booth Theater Live. <laughs> Maybe I should have done that for the Jareth one. That would have been great. I did all. I, I sung like a bunch of the songs too. Magic jump, magic jump. <laughs> oh my god, I love that movie. Yeah, you got about five minutes. Just don't chomp too loud. Oh, I'm here. Wait, which Jeff? I'm just kidding, Ian. <laughs> we 
broken. <laughs> we can't hear you. <laughs> I'm sending out a thing on Twitter. I'll go retweeter it. I don't think I have, like, a significant number of Twitter followers. I don't know what, really, a significant number would be. I don't use, I don't use Twitter appropriately for business, I don't think. I think for business you're supposed to tweet, like, the same thing every, every couple hours or something. So that, uh, there's actually a chance someone might see your, your tweet all your followers will see your tweet because it's not like people well I don't know maybe they do just stay glued to Twitter but even if they did it's one tweet out of like a billion per day that must be going through people's feeds at once I'm awful at it terrible I'm pretty bad at Facebook too it's not good to have poor social media skills. This is a three hour stream. Yes, sir. I don't know how, how far I'll actually get in the book with that. This is a long one. I believe 140,000 words or so. Blaze are I Blaze might not have his uh, sound on. Oh well, maybe he. It just took a while for me to respond. I am on Twitter like almost not at all. I think you just have you. I think social media you just have to use it. If you just use it a lot, then you might you might get somewhere with it. I use Facebook all the time, but not in a constructive way. <laughs> I don't think. I think I'm just terrible with marketing language. ready. started here pretty soon uh, thanks for coming thanks for showing up for the Delvers stream um, before I get started today I wanted to remind you all that uh, the last book of the divine series is now out um, so excited book number seven wraps up really well Mar Forbes did a great job with it. It's his, it's his first series, my first successful series, and uh, as, as the books progress, they keep getting better. So, um, last one is out. That's what the music is. It's from the last book. So, if you um, if you want to finish off that story, it's there. It's available, ready to go. So. 
that. So we're on chapter one, and just to remind you, everybody, um, this is Lit RPG, Delver's LLC. Uh, it's by a man named Blaze Corvin, and uh, I'm really impressed with it. Uh, really good characters, really gets into their psyches, you know, really, really um, talks about their emotions a lot. And that's what I like when you're getting into a story like this, because if it's just stats, it's just I, like I, I was expecting a bunch of video game stats, no stats, barely any stats. Uh, and that's what I like about it. I really do, because stats are like, I mean, they're funny if they're used right, but that's not the point of a story. The stats are like, uh, I feel like this story, this particular game world, it's like all that stuff is under the hood and they just let a story be told and it kind of implies all the stats with, you know, the things that are happening. Um, we have a lot of awesome characters, uh, including the great god Dolos, who I think is very funny. And uh, actually, Blaze and I had to go back and forth just a little bit to make sure to get him correct. Um, I, when I did the first demo of him here on Sound Booth Live, Sound Booth Theater Live, I don't even know the name of my own show. Um, when I did his voice th for the first time here, I tried to go with like a laid back, almost cockney sound, um, just to get that smart ass out of him. But it turns out that Blaze wanted more of a Greek sound, so... And I, and I think that's fitting, considering he's like this god-type character, so... Uh... <laughs> so, um, yeah. I am ready to get this started. Another planet. Jason had no idea what the hell just happened. He blinked at Henry and slowly looked around, keeping the rest of his body completely still. When his eyes met Henry's again, only the wild shock he saw on his friend's face convinced him he was not imagining things. Well, that and his butt still itched from a mosquito bite he'd gotten earlier that day. The discomfort of the insect bite and the sound of the soft breeze rustling through the grass somehow drove home his reality. He definitely wasn't dreaming. Both men stood in modern martial arts protective gear, holding polypropylene training swords in guard positions. The hill they stood on rose out of a small valley, surrounded by... S First mess up. The hill they stood on rose out of a small valley, surrounded by flowers poking up out of long grass that swayed in the light breeze. The clouds overhead served as a patchwork ceiling for the mountains in the distance. It was a beautiful place. The only problem was that seconds earlier, both men had been surrounded by a wooden fence in Jason's backyard. Jason glanced down at his feet, continuing to keep the rest of his body still and saw he was crushing some flowers. He thought back carefully to the moment he'd suddenly found himself in the field and barely remembered feeling a slight drop before hitting the ground again. Almost at the same time, he lowered his training sword. Nope. Almost at the same time he lowered his training sword, he saw Henry do the same. Henry's short goatee complemented his Asian features, and he looked casually comfortable in sweats and training gear, same as he always looked. Jason had always been a little jealous of how Henry could pull that off. Jason felt awkward and gangly in anything he wore. He took his fencing mask and padded helmet off, turning in place to glance behind him. He couldn't see any buildings or other signs of civilization anywhere. He was about to ask Henry what was going on, when a loud voice thundered, Hello! 
Jason was almost startled out of his skin. While he was still remembering how to breathe and putting his heart back in his chest, Jason realized the voice had come from above him. He looked up and saw a huge man wearing odd clothing and a mocking grin hovering in midair about thirty feet off the ground. It was obvious the giant was aware how badly he'd startled both men on the ground. Jason immediately disliked him, the feeling transcending his surprise at meeting a ten-foot-tall man who could defy gravity. The man in the air wore clothes that left strange places, like his knees, uncovered, but flowed and gathered in awe. The man in the air wore clothes that left strange places, like his knees, uncovered, but flowed and gathered in other odd areas, like his wrists. His clothing's colors were all over the place, too. It sort of looked like... It sort of looked like he'd tried wearing a few different outfits composed of every color of the rainbow all at once. And beneath all of that, Jason could see flashes of metal as wo And beneath, and beneath all of that, Jason could see flashes of metal as well as tools of some sort hanging off of a belt. The huge man's somehow graceful legs ended in stone sandals, and his head bore a crown of the same material. His face was completely hairless, and his facial structure was subtly different from any Jason had ever seen before. <sighs> His face was completely hairless, and his facial structure was subtly different from any Jason had ever seen before. He looked like an idealized version of a man. He looked like an idealized version of a man. The man bowed in midair, spread his arms, and said, You'll have to forgive me for skipping the small duck. But I've transported so many of you disgusting little Terrans to this planet that I no longer bother. It's not personal. You may call me Dolos, the great god Dolos. He seemed to wait a few seconds for signs of recognition at the same... He seemed to wait a few seconds for signs of recognition at the name, but Jason and Henry were too busy. Did I say Henry? He seemed to wait a few seconds for signs of recognition at the name, but Jason and Henry were too busy staring with their mouths open. Dolos made an impatient gesture and grunted. Of course, I already know who you two are. He pointed at Jason and said, Jason James Booth, twenty-seven Terran years old, working in IT, single, nothing all that amazing about you. You have an embarrassing fondness for children's cartoons and candy. I doubt that you will survive long. Then he pointed at Henry. And you, Henry Mirai Sato, 29 years old, recently divorced, used to be a U.S. Army combat medic, but worked as an EMT for the last few years. He dropped out of college to work full-time because your mother got cancer and your family needed money. Dolo smiled grimly and said, you probably have a better chance of survival than your friend, but I doubt you will live more than a week either. Ah, let me try that one again. You probably have a better chance of survival than your friend, but I doubt you will live more than a week either. And just like that, oops, there is a weird pop. <laughs> and just like that, Jason's shock and fear began to evaporate. Rather than stunning or amazing him, as Dolos had probably intended, the brief summaries of their lives just pissed him off. This floating guy was a dickhead. He began opening his mouth to say so, but Henry was already asking, What do you want with us? Dolos rolled his eyes. Me, me, me. I, I, I. That's all you people ever say. Jason tried to suppress his irritation and confusion. He scowled and said, Well, didn't you just transport us here? Doesn't that by definition make this about us? The man in the air sighed. <sighs> See, 
This is why I can't stand Terrans. Instead of being appropriately awestruck and appreciative that I didn't miscalculate your travel over hundreds of light years, almost instantaneously, you give me cheek. Seriously, why aren't you people on your knees begging for mercy or something? Where is the adoration? You aren't even pissing yourselves. The universe is going to hell, I swear. Jason glanced at Henry and saw his friend pressing his lips together. He recognized this expression. Henry was fighting down his temper in order to think. Jason screwed up his courage, controlled his frustration, and coughed before asking, <coughs> Uh, sir, could you tell us why we're here? You're where I wanted you to be. This is my experiment planet, Lutus. I really... I really despise working with you filthy little Terrans. Sorry. I really despise working with you filthy little Terrans. But at least your creation has furthered my own goals. I'm very proud of my research here. I need new stock. So here you are. An experiment planet? asked Jason. Yes. I don't care what the other Gracias are doing on your squalid little Terra. But I'm thankful you were created. Throwing Terrans into the mix on Ludus has yielded some surprising data. Anyway, I'm sure you will figure it out. Well, maybe not. Either way, I'm hoping you'll live long enough to rub two brain cells together. Terrans are resil- Terrans are resilient. Ugh. That R roll is... Difficult. Terrans are resilient like cockroaches, after all. Worst creature Lilith ever created, cockroaches. Dolos made a gesture, and a bag fell out of midair a dozen feet away. Here are some toys for you to play with. Please don't die too fast, or I won't be able to get decent data from your short and meaningless lives. Henry broke his silence, shouting, Listen, asshole! Hold on a minute! What reason do we have to do anything? You haven't told us if we will ever see Earth again, or even explained what any of this is about at all. Where the hell are we? Dolos narrowed his eyes, and the ground began to shake. He said very quietly, I don't like being talked to that way. Why shouldn't I just obliterate you right now? Henry clenched his jaw. Jason winced. When Henry was angry, very little could make him back down. His friend squared his shoulders and snarled. Because you just complained about how it was a struggle to bring us here. You wouldn't have spent any energy in the first place if it wasn't worth it to you. Killing us would waste all that effort. You obviously had time to research us before you transported us here, so we were at... So we were either targeted or screened. And most importantly... I have no idea what the fuck is going on, and if I can never get home, I'm not sure how much I care about living anyway. Either start talking, or kill me, motherfucker. Jason looked down as the ground shook more, but he felt an odd sense of calm. He would have said his piece differently, but he agreed with Henry. He would have said... He would have said his piece differently, but he agreed with Henry. What's more, he was oddly okay with the idea of dying while spitting defiance in the face of a god. When the ground stopped shaking and he heard Dolos chuckle, he realized he wasn't going to die after all. Well, at least not immediately anyway. Dolos shook his head. <clears throat> Incentives, huh? I will give Terrans this. You don't lack for vigor. Okay, fine. Jason Booth. And Henry Sato. If you succeed in conquering and uniting all the kingdoms on this continent, I will send you back to the mud hole you came from. To have any hope, you'd better use the orbs in the bag over there wisely. Read the instructions. Whoever wrote them was very wise, probably powerful, and worth worshipping, too. Damn it. I'm not into that one. Whoever wrote them was very wise, probably powerful and worth worshipping, too. 
Whoever wrote them was very wise. Probably powerful and worth worshipping, too. <laughs> All right, got to layer that one. Then, without a further word, Dolos laughed as he ascended into the sky, eventually producing a sonic boom as he sped away into the distance. After a few moments passed, Henry muttered, Well, that just happened. What an asshole. Do you think he really was a god? Do you think he really... Do you think he... <laughs> Do you think he was really a god? Jason was still watching this. Jason was still watching the point in the sky that Dolos disappeared to. He said, Does it really matter at this point? He was beginning to feel lightheaded. I guess not. It's not like our situation is going to change. We really need to figure out what the fuck is going on. Jason nodded slowly. I'm going to sit down for a minute. He flopped down on the grass, and both men were quiet for a while. Jason let his mind go blank, preparing to deal with the situation. He ruefully thought, Resetting your brain can work almost as well as resetting a PC. Henry picked... Oops. Nope. Henry picked up a small stone and threw it as he stared off into the distance. He said, what's probably most important now is figuring out where we are. I still don't understand how we were brought here in the first place. Jason looked down at his forearms thoughtfully. I have an idea about that, actually. He removed his forearm armor and carefully inspected it. Nope, I'm not seeing anything out of place. But I bet it was our armor. What do you mean? Well, you said that the two sets of Hema gear you found online were super cheap. Maybe the Stolos wanted people from our planet who were interested in swords or hand-to-hand -hand combat. Jason cocked his head. He felt like he and his friend were forgetting something they should have been doing. Ah. Oops. Jason cocked his head. He felt like he and his friend were forgetting something they should have been doing. Actually, what was that? Oh. Actually... Shouldn't we be freaking out or something? I mean, this did just happen. He waved his hand, indicating the world around them. Henry shook his head and said, No, that won't do us any good, and we both know it. I have a few years of scraping people off the pavement to settle my nerves. You're a computer geek, so you're automatically abnormal. I guess neither of us is very normal. Whatever the fuck normal means. We still need to figure out what's going on. I keep thinking I'm dreaming but my dreams usually don't include sweat running down my back. Well, you're right what... Well, you're right that we need more information. There could be some clues over there in that bag. Jason pointed at the duffel bag lying in the grass. Let's straighten this out a little bit. And let's get rid of that. And that. And that. Okay. They dumped the duffel bag out and took a quick inventory. Inside was a cheap machete, an unfilier... <clears throat> An unfamiliar map, a medical kit from Target, a Swiss Army pocket knife, a rifle with no bullets, and a wooden box about the size of a Tupperware container. Henry scratched his head. Well, uh, this is underwhelming. What's in the box? Jason opened the box and saw two rough, folded pieces of paper resting on top of what looked like two small metal marbles. Eh? Wow, my computer stalled out for a second. That's so weird. Okay. 
wants to go down here. And where did I mess up? See, my voice cracked there. That was weird. Okay. Sorry. Where did it go? Where? Jason opened the box and saw two rough, folded pieces of paper resting on top of what looked like two small metal marbles. What the hell? He unfolded the larger piece. <clears throat> he unfolded the larger piece of paper and read it out loud. Congratulations! You have been selected by the great god Dolos to colonize his pleasure planet, Ludus. Like any adventure worth having, living on Ludus has an element of danger. Great god Dolos, in his wisdom, has seen fit to populate Ludus with most of the major human races, Ariva, Mohali, Adom, Fideli, and Terrans. He has hidden great treasures all over Ludus for brave colonists to find, but they are all guarded by demons that have inhabited Ludus since the dawn of time. Jason looked up from reading. It is seriously obvious that Dolos wrote this thing by himself. Henry nodded. Total ass clown. What does the rest of it say? Jason continued reading. The great god Dolos was searching for people like you to come to Ludus. You have been carefully selected by intricate arcane means to fulfill Dolos's plans. You may find special gear to prepare you for your new life that the generous god Dolos has preserved. You, you may find special gear to prepare you for your new life that the generous god Dolos has provided you. While supplies last. Under the printed message, Jason read a handwritten note, presumably also by Dolos. Too many new additions in the last century who don't know anything. Hairdressers can't build siege weapons. The world is getting boring. Need fighting men. I guess you will do if you don't die. Magic in the box. I will check on you in a year. If you are dead, I will not care. D. Jason looked up again and said, This guy is... Oh, sorry, Jason. This guy is just utterly charming. Henry picked up the second piece of paper and read, Each device will confer one magic type of your choosing, as well as the ability to understand and speak Luda, the official language of Ludus. When you are ready to accept your blessings from the great god Dolos, swallow one device and think of the magic you wish to learn all day and again right before you fall asleep. Great god Dolos is merciful and powerful. Henry eyed the two metal marbles sitting in the box warily. What if they're poison or something? I don't think they would be. I don't think they would be, for the same reasons you told Dolos he won't directly kill us. Plus, it doesn't make sense to poison us with marbles when he probably could have just demolished us where we were standing. Jason felt something tickling the back of his mind while he... <clears throat> Jason felt something tickling the back of his mind while he was answering Henry. He felt like he was missing something important. That's true. Henry started to reach for one of the marbles. Jason held a hand out, stopping him. We should probably wait until we have more data before using these. I'm getting a strange feeling of familiarity here, and I want to think about this some more first. Henry nodded, and the two of them gathered up all their new belongings. They kept their sports armor on, and Henry kept the machete without either of them discussing it. Jason was actually the better swordsman, but Henry was a combat vet. Jason knew if it came to violence, Henry had seen more of it than Jason, including the consequences. Including the consequences. Heck, Henry saw terrible stuff every other week with his EMT job. Henry began walking and Jason followed while using his polypropylene sword as a walking stick. Jason asked, Why are we going this direction? Henry pointed at the map in his hand. We need to get to high ground so I can hopefully figure out where the fuck we are. 
There's a mark on this map that might be our location, but I want to double check. At least there are lots of landmarks around here. Jason nodded and kept his silence. They walked for a while when Henry suddenly said, I'm sorry, I probably almost got us both fried. I'm sorry I almost... I'm sorry I probably almost got us both fried back there. I'm still surprised you're keeping it all... <sighs> I'm still surprised you're keeping it together so well, too. I mean, I know I'm a weirdo, and because of what I do for a living, not much phases me anymore. But what about you? To be clear, I'm definitely not complaining. Jason chuckled grimly. <laughs> We've known each other a long time, man. Don't you remember how I had to take my mom to the women's shelter when I was 15? I grew up with an abusive, alcoholic stepfather. Dealing with some floating bully with bad fashion sense isn't going to impress me much these days. Sure, the fact that he's flying is new, but the attitude isn't anything I haven't encountered before, and I'm a grown man now. My freak-out meter is... My freak-out meter is... Uh... My freak-out meter is either set really, really high, or it's completely broken now. Henry nodded and grunted. Jason wasn't sure what it meant. He hadn't mastered the grunt language that Henry defaulted to sometimes. As they trudged along, Jason wondered why he'd brought up his stepfather. He usually didn't talk much about things from that portion of his past. His nerves must have been truly frayed to casually discuss the worst chapter of his life. Both men kept walking until they reached the top of a large hill. The sun was beginning to set, and after Henry was sure they were oriented the sun was beginning to set, and after Henry was sure they were oriented correctly using landmarks on the map, they realized the sun was actually setting to the east. That was going to take some getting used to. Jason was about to take some... Jason was about to tell Henry they should think about making a camp or something, when both men... Oops. Garage door. Ian asks, is it harder to flip back and forth between two male characters? I don't really, I don't know. Maybe? It's hard to say. Um, it, I think it's, it's harder the closer they are together, but also the further apart they are together. There's like this tricky medium where... Contrast is good. Contrast makes it a little bit easier to to shift, but only only if it's not too extreme. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know. But there there's a threshold on both ends. Once it's too similar, it's like then you have to make the subtle changes and you're not sure whether or not you made enough sometimes. Jason was about to tell Henry they should think about making a camp or something when both men saw the goblins in the distance. Okay. First chapter. So yeah, first chapter. I, I think that's how lit RPG handles things. They just kind of drop you right in the middle of it. Um, Blaze asks, how hard is it to go between Jason and Henry? I think they're... Um, both of their voices are pretty... Uh, pretty standard actors in my troupe. I'm very used to both of them, so um, it's it's fairly simple between those two. Actually, it's it's harder to shift between the narrator and Henry because Henry is uh, I don't know if you guys recognize him, but Henry is actually Connor from Dead of Night. Um, so uh, I'm used to narrating with that voice, and that voice is very close to my narration voice, so I, it's just a very subtle, it's like a, it's like one gear shift right here that I have to do, and I have to let, I have to let, uh, I have to let the texture catch just right for his voice.
goblins. Henry squinted and strained to observe the goblins walking through a clearing on a hillside about 150 yards away. They were small and green with huge ears and long noses. Henry judged they were about three and a half feet tall. He actually didn't know what they were, but their general appearance made goblins seem an appropriate term. He and Jason were both flat on their stomachs, looking over the top of a hill. Both men had hit the ground to be less visible as soon as they saw humanoid movement. Well, Henry had, and he'd dragged Jason down with him. Luckily, his Hema fencing armor was thick enough that the damp forest mulch wasn't uncomfortable and wasn't getting him wet. Jason whispered, What do we do? Henry frowned and whispered back, Nothing for right now. We're just being cautious. We don't know for sure they're hostile. For all we know, those things are peaceful and just look weird to us. Right about that time, a few more goblins emerged from the trees, leading an old man, a young woman, and a little boy through the clearing. The prisoners were restrained, and it was obvious that they were all in rough shape. A goblin holding a spear brought up the rear and prodded the young boy to walk faster. The boy cried out. Oh, hell, Henry quietly cursed. Uh-oh. My computer is stalling again. I should have gone for a restart before I started the, uh, the stream. Jason looked resigned. You know, if we're actually going to survive in this place, we shouldn't get involved. Yep. But we're going to get involved anyway, aren't we? Henry was conflicted. He really didn't want to die. He was also extremely tired and still adjusting to the situation. He'd already had a full weekend of practicing sword drills with Jason before getting zapped to Ludus. He'd also just hiked through the woods for an hour. He had a suspicion that whatever Dolos did to get them here was affecting him too. Unfortunately, there were some things he knew he couldn't walk away from. Certain things he couldn't tolerate because he had to live with himself as long as he still pre Certain things he couldn't tolerate... Ah. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, there were some things he knew he couldn't walk away from. Certain things he couldn't tolerate because he had to live with himself as long as he still breathed. His moral code was clear on the situation, but he also had his friend to think about. He paused and asked Jason, What do you think? Jason scratched his chin. His tall, lanky frame was sprawled out awkwardly, obviously not used to hiding from... His tall, lanky frame was sprawled out awkwardly, obviously not used to hiding from prying eyes. His brown hair was uncombed, as usual, and Henry thought he looked like a goof. However, in moments like these, Henry thought Jason's intellect was obvious. He could practically see the gears turning in his friend's mind. Henry would never understand why so many girls found his friend attractive, or how Jason could be so oblivious to all the attention. It must have been the... Hmm. That sounded clumsy somehow. Henry would never understand how... Henry would never understand why so many girls found his friend attractive, nor how Jason could be so oblivious to all the attention. It must have been the thin air that tall people had to breathe. Jason replied, Well, those people obviously need help. I've never even... I've never even been in much of a real fight as an adult... But I know a good reason for fighting. <laughs> I've never even been in much of a real fight as an adult, but I know a good reason for fighting when I see it. Plus, I know you want to get the... <laughs> Damn. Plus, I know you want to go help those people, and there are worse ways to die than doing something right with a friend. Henry was touched. 
He'd hung out with Jason a lot the last few years, especially after his divorce. It was nice to know that their friendship... All right, I need to get back on track. What's going on here? It was nice to know that their friendship meant as much to Jason as it did to him. Plus, it spoke volumes that Jason was willing to watch his back and possibly even die while doing so. They were in a ridiculous situation. They were probably both in shock, but his friend's inter... But his friend's inherent goodness and integrity seemed to be immutable. Henry wished he was that good of a person. Henry wished he was that good of a person. Okay. Ah. Okay. Let's move over to that clearing. Try to walk as quietly as possible. Look for straight sticks or small trees we can make into spears. Jason pointed at their pro- Jason pointed at their pro- Jason pointed at their polypropylene practice weapons. Will these do us any good? You know I'm pretty good with a longsword, but I'm not that great with a spear. Henry shook his head. He said, No, those goblins or whatever the fuck they are had metal weapons. Metal will cut right through this stuff. He demonstrated his point by easily cutting into the guard of his training sword with the machete. Our Hema armor should help a bit, though. I mean, I'd rather be wearing steel, but this stuff beats a fucking t-shirt. Why did I want to say frickin'? I'm not Mormon. I mean, I'd rather be wearing steel, but this stuff beats a fucking t-shirt. Jason nodded glumly, and after hiding the useless training weapons in a bush, the pair started moving through the forest to where they'd seen the goblins. While they walked, they fashioned a few makeshift spears using the pocket knife from the duffel bag. Henry noticed that some of the foliage was unlike any he'd ever seen before. Sunlight from the greenish-blue sky slanted through trees and lighted on a bush with pretty pink flowers about thirty feet ahead of them. I could have completed that one without a pause. Sunlight from the bluish gr <clears throat> greenish blue. Sunlight from the greenish blue sky slanted through the trees and lighted on a bush with pretty pink flowers about thirty feet ahead of them. He suddenly froze in his tracks and put an arm out to stop Jason too. Jason looked at him questioningly, but Henry just shook his head. He wasn't quite sure why he stopped, and he wasn't getting any clues from just staring at the bush. Eventually, he grunted, motioning Jason to follow him in a path around the bush and the flowers. Henry had learned to listen to his hunches through painful experience. He was damn sure not going to ignore his gut on a strange planet while moving towards a fight. When the two men reached the clearing they'd seen the goblins and prisoners pass through, they discovered a well-worn trail. Henry knew that if he and Jason were smart, they'd scout the area around them, do a few days of recon, then formulate a plan of attack with at least ten other people. Unfortunately, their situation sucked. They had no backup, just a cheap machete and a handful of makeshift spears. Not for the first time, Henry wished he could just walk away from helping other people in terrible circumstances. He just couldn't bring himself to do it, though. Henry knew he was a lot of Henry knew he was a lot of not-so-great things, but a coward was not one of them. He was having serious doubts they were going to survive attacking the goblin creatures. He and Jason had only been on another world for a couple hours. He was even thinking about telling Jason to turn back so he could just go ahead by himself until he saw the blood. He was even thinking about telling Jason to turn back so he could... He was even thinking about telling Jason to turn back so he could just go ahead by himself, until he saw the blood. He squatted down and bent closer. Yes, he could see blood in and around the human footprints. At least one of the prisoners was badly injured. That was a, that was a mouth pop, by the way. 
That's why I'm retaking that. At least one of the prisoners was badly injured. These people didn't need a martyr. They needed a rescue. Henry steeled his resolve and felt the strange but familiar calm he always experienced in combat or crap. Henry steeled his resolve and felt the strange but familiar calm he always experienced in combat or car crashes. Car crashes that most definitely were not his fault. Definitely not his fault. He gestured Jason over and whispered, We have to be really quiet now while we follow this trail. For all we know, they have a camp a few dozen feet away. Jason nodded. He asked, Do we have a plan? I don't. Do you? I was afraid you were going to say that. Jason sighed. Let's try that more sigh e. Sigh like. I was afraid you were going to say that. There we go. Both men. Both men began slowly carefully, following the trail through the woods. They walked for about fifteen minutes until the path began to snake around a hill. Henry got a bad feeling as they approached a blind corner around a rock outcropping and motioned Jason to be careful. Jason nervously nodded and readied one of his makeshift spears in one hand, the rest held under his other arm. As they crept forward, Henry smelled a new, acrid odor under the normal, loamy scent of the forest. In two more steps, they came upon a goblin relieving itself against a tree, just... Mm, against a tree. In two more steps, they came upon a goblin relieving itself against a tree just off the trail. The goblin turned its head as the two men rounded the bend. The goblin turned its head as the two men rounded the bend. It was hard to tell which party was more surprised, but Jason acted first. With a grunt of a oh, man. With a grunt of effort, he whipped his long arm forward, and more by luck than skill, his makeshift spear went right through the goblin's neck. Dark ichor welled up from the terrible wound, and the goblin fell to the ground, trashing around Thrashing. Dark ichor welled up from the terrible wound, and the goblin fell to the ground, thrashing around, its eyes dilated and its mouth open as it tried to scream. Luckily, all it could manage was a tortured gurgle. The goblin's loincloth flipped up, and Henry amended. And Henry amended. The goblin's loincloth flipped up, and Henry... The goblin's loincloth flipped up, and Henry amended. Ah, it's a he, not an it. Henry stepped forward quickly to end the goblin's suffering with his machete. When he turned around, he saw Jason staring at the goblin in sick fascination for a full five seconds, before throwing up. Henry left his friend alone to get control of himself and began checking the goblin's gear with clinical detachment. The creature was a mess and smelled horrible, but Henry had seen worse. Along with the loincloth, the goblin was wearing a crude vest made of hide. The creature also had a small bag with some near-rancid dried meat and a little stoneware water bottle corked with wax. For weapons, the goblin was carrying a flint spear and a long, bronze sack-style knife. Henry thought this goblin could have been the one that stabbed the boy in the clearing. S Henry not. Jason. Serves the little mother... Serves the little mother... <laughs> Serves the little motherfucker right, he muttered. He stood up and saw Jason was wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. His friend was still a little green, but he was pulling himself back together. Henry tossed him the long, bronze knife and kept the flint spear for himself. I'm sorry, Jason whispered. He didn't look at the goblin and kept his eyes on the trail. It's really dead, right? Henry nodded and said... Yeah, it's dead. Don't worry about it. Your reaction is pretty normal. You've never even gone hunting, have you? Jason shook his head. No. I think what really bothers me is that we don't even know if we are the good guys here. We might have just committed murder. No. For better or for worse, we've decided to war on these things. 
he grimaced. It's true we're in a new place and this is pretty insane, but it was obvious that those people we saw needed help. Restraining people, making them march while bleeding, and wounding children with weapons are all pretty good signs of being an asshole. Jason nodded thoughtfully and examined the bronze knife. This thing is pretty crude, but it actually has good balance for throwing. Good. Maybe you can throw it then. I know you practice that stuff. Henry nudged the dead goblin with his foot. This thing didn't have any armor, but we can't be sure that will be the case up ahead. Jason nodded, and the two men began following the trail again. Adrenaline made Henry's heart beat like crazy, but he tried to be calm. They pushed forward like that for another ten minutes before the trail ended at the... They pushed forward like that for another ten minutes before the trail ended at the entrance to a creepy cave. Two skulls sat on the ground to either side of the opening, and they could see a torch sputtering a few steps inside. There was a faint animal-like smell coming from inside. Jason gave him a questioning glance, and Henry briefly considered what they should do. In the end, he couldn't think of anything clever. <clears throat> In the end, he couldn't think of anything clever and shrugged. He pantomimed walking slowly and looking around, then he put a finger over his lips. Jason nodded, and both men entered the cave, weapons at the ready. As they moved forward, Henry surreptitiously watched Jason to see whether his friend was going to crack under stress. However, while Jason's hands were shaking and he was swallowing his feet, <clears throat> excuse me. However. However, while Jason's hands were shaking and he was swallowing in fear, his eyes were steady and his jaw was clenched. Henry was impressed. Henry was impressed. Henry was impressed. The first time he'd seen combat in the Middle East, one of his friends in the army pissed himself. Jason was handling his first... E Jason was handling his first W... Jason... This is going to be hard to say. Jason was handling his first WTF moment fairly well, especially since they were walking into a dark fucked-up, creepy-ass cave, tracking down fantasy creatures for a fight to the death. Henry thought it was strange that the goblins didn't have a lookout posted. He cocked his head and listened while the nearby torch cast shadows against the wall next to him. He thought he could hear something in the distance. The little bits of noise he caught made his hackles rise. They continued deeper into the cave, and the smell kept growing worse the deeper they got. The lonely pools of torchlight gave barely enough illumination to see by as they crept forward. The walls perspired with dirty water, and the cave's stone floor was pitted with random, shallow holes. A deep, natural rut almost twisted Henry's ankle, and he was barely able to steady himself in time. The cave eventually turned into a natural tunnel, and the noises ahead bounced around in disconcerting ways. Henry could see more concentrated torchlight coming from where the cave started to open up again. He got low, motioning for Jason to do the same, and they moved forward cautiously until they could see into the area ahead. The scene they were greeted with was horrific. The chamber before them was actually a few feet lower than where they were crouched down, a natural ramp leading from the tunnel down to the floor. The old man they'd seen earlier in the clearing was lying in a heap against the wall, a bump on his head and blood leaking from his temple. The woman was being held down by two goblins, while a third was cutting off her clothes with a stone knife. She was screaming, her voice weak and desperate. Every time she tried to struggle, one of the goblins casually hit her in the face with the back of its hand. The little boy. Henry swallowed. He'd seen some... Henry swallowed. He'd seen some terrible things in war, and while working as an emergency respon- Henry swallowed. He'd seen some terrible things in war and while working as an emergency responder, but it always hit him hardest when kids got hurt. 
what he was seeing. He knew he was going to have nightmares. More nightmares. The boy was dead, and two goblins were butchering the body as if it were the carcass of an animal. Blood spread in an enormous pool on the floor in an area that seemed dug out as a fire pit. Henry noted in a detached sort of way that the goblins probably butchered things in the fire pits while they weren't being... Henry noted in a... Henry noted in a detached sort of way that the goblins probably butchered things in the fire pits while they weren't being used and then built fires to burn up the offal. One goblin that was bigger than the others wore crude bone armor and stood by a torch, observing the butchery with a smile. Henry figured he was the bo Henry figured he was the boss goblin. He counted a total of six goblins, including the armored boss. He assumed all of them were male. Henry glanced at Jason and saw tears in his friend's eyes. He had a feeling that Jason was no longer conflicted with the morality of killing goblins or whatever the... He had a feeling that Jason was no longer conflicted with the morality of killing goblins or whatever these fucking things were. Henry held out a hand, and Jason handed him one of the crude, green wood spears. He held up three fingers, then two, then one, counting down. Jason's eyes were wild, but his f Jason's eyes were wild, but his shoulders were squared and his nostrils flared. For the fir <laughs> Every sentence now. For the second time that day, Henry felt honored to know his friend. He knew they might die in the next few minutes, but he felt deep pride in the course of action they were taking. He was damn sure not going to walk away from evil like this, and he respected his friend's courage in joining him. As soon as Henry made a fist, both men jumped up and attacked, their yells blending with the screams of the woman on the floor and the chittering of goblins. Chapter Done what are we at? It looks like an average of about 17 minutes or so. Maybe. So far. How are we doing on stream time? We are at an hour. Not bad, not bad. Still getting used to the stool. <sighs> Battle in the cave. <clears throat> Battle in the cave. The first spear Jason threw hit one of the goblins squatting over the butchered body. He saw the goblin next to it go down too. Henry's greenwood spear stick. Henry's greenwood spear sticking out of its back. Jason felt tears running down his cheeks as he screamed in defiance and fear. The goblins were caught completely off guard. Most of their weapons were stacked in the corner of the room. Jason thanked God for small favors. He knew that without the element of surprise, he and Henry would probably already be dead. After the first two goblins went down, Henry ran forward to the goblin on top of the woman and nearly decapitated it. After the first two goblins went down, oops, no, no. That was close. After the first two goblins went down. <laughs> and thanks for stopping by, Frustrated Ego. Um, yep, I hope you're having fun. After the first two goblins went down, Henry ran forward to the goblin on top of the woman and nearly decapitated it with a mighty swing of his machete. The goblin died, 
pawing at its neck while blood drenched its filthy clothing. Then Henry spun and used his remaining spear in one hand. That was weird. Then Henry spun and used his remaining spear in one hand, his machete in the other, and held off the two remaining goblins near the woman. Jason found himself facing off against the boss goblin. In any other circumstance, he would have been hesitant about a life-or-death battle with a capable-looking fantasy monster, but the horror of the butchered boy gave him crystal-clear focus. Just like he'd always done in training, he slightly unfocused his eyes and watched the movements of his opponent. He ignored the tears and snot running down his face. The goblin boss was about four feet tall. Jason had a hard time regarding the goblin as a he, a thinking creature. He decided to think of the goblins as it, monsters. The boss goblin's armor looked primarily made of bone held together with sinew, and Jason knew that his improvised wooden spears wouldn't be much use against it. This meant he had to aim for unprotected areas like the head, legs, and arms. The goblin carried an old-looking tarnished bronze sword and a shield made of hide. The goblin shrieked something at Jason, spittle foaming at the corners of its mouth. Jason kept calm and jabbed at its exposed areas while parrying with the two spears he still held in his other hand. The goblin was nimble and surprisingly strong. Jason noticed that the two creatures Henry was fighting were both armed with stone knives and his friend was about... Jason noticed that the two creatures Henry was fighting were both armed with stone knives and his friend was about to be overwhelmed. Jason made a split-second decision to, took to take a risk. Jason made a split-second decision to took... This is why typos are annoying. Jason made a split-second decision and take a... No, it's not a typo. I'm just fucking stupid. <laughs> Jason made a split-second decision and... Jason made a split-second decision and took a risk. He hurled a spear at the goblin boss to get some breathing room, stepped back, and threw his bronze knife at one of Henry's opponents. The knife hit point first, but Jason's aim was off. He only managed to impale its thigh. It was enough, though. The wounded goblin slowed down noticeably from the wound, and Henry was able to stab it in the chest with the flint spear. Then hang... Hangry, then hangry, sprang back. Then, hang... then Henry sprang back, blocked a wild spring. Durr. Then Henry sprang back, blocked a wild swing, and used his machete to finish off the other goblin. The goblin boss would have killed Jason if not for his Hema armor, and the training gear gave just enough protection to stop the bronze sword from cutting him to ribbons. His arm holding his blocking spear was numb, and he was covered in bruises. He had to grit his teeth and fight through the pain. His lungs became even more desperate for air. After Henry ruthlessly chopped each of the go- After Henry ruthlessly chopped each of the goblins on the floor- chopped, ruthlessly chopped each of the gob- okay. After Henry ruthlessly chopped each of the goblins on the floor to ensure they were down for good, he flanked the goblin boss. Henry and Jason worked together to kill the leader, but it still put up one hell of a fight. The armored monster was surprisingly skilled. The bronze sword it used may have looked old, but it was still sharp and effective. By the time the boss went down, Jason's blocking spear was just one or two more chops away from being cut through. Then all the goblins were dead. The only sounds in the dank, bloody, horrifying cave were Jason and Henry's labored breathing. The woman... The woman on the ground had long since stopped screaming and was watching them with huge eyes, eyes that now carried a glimmer of hope. Henry shook his head and mumbled, what kind of fucked up world is this? Jason could only silently agree with his assessment. He was exhausted, but he slowly plodded forward, approaching the traumatized woman, and knelt down so he could talk to her at eye level. This close, Jason noticed that she was younger than he had originally thought and might be pretty under all... 
This close. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just I just saw the the absolutely random advertisement. I'm pretty sure that's not an advertisement. I'm pretty sure that's a troll. DJ in a world with aliens. <laughs> that's so funny. This close, Jason noticed that she was younger. Jason noticed that she was so. This close, Jason noticed that she was younger than he had originally thought, and might be pretty under all the grime and filth. Her tawny skin was scratched all over. The girl's ambiguous racial background gave her an exotic look. Are you okay? he asked. The girl scrunched up her nose, holding back tears, and responded in a language Jason had never heard before. He shook his head and asked, Do you speak English? As soon as the words left his mouth, he knew how stupid he sounded. He was on another planet, somehow a sword and sorcery planet, and he just asked a local if she spoke English. Stupid, 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 awkward Jason! People on new planets aren't going to speak English. At this rate, I'll have to change my name to Daniel Jackson. Whoa, Daniel Jackson is here. That's pretty funny. The girl looked down. Yes, I speak... But I'm not perfect. Jason's jaw dropped. He glanced back at Henry and saw his friend was trying to wake the injured old man with no success. When Jason turned back to the girl, she was gazing at the old man with concern and obvious distress. Man is grandfather. Please, let help. He nodded dumbly and helped the girl to her feet as she tried holding the tatters of her clothing together. She knelt down next to the old man, closed her eyes, and placed a hand on his head. Jason gasped as her palm suddenly began to glow. He watched in fascination as the girl's hand continued glowing and the old man's injuries healed before his eyes. He'd never seen anything like it before. Based on the letter Dolos had given them, coupled with his experiences so far, Jason was willing to believe magic existed on this world. However, actually seeing it in person was amazing. After the girl was done, the old, umber-skinned man no longer had any visible wounds. He began to breathe more easily. The girl looked exhausted and sat limply on the cave floor. She obviously didn't have the energy anymore to care about her destroyed clothes. As Henry gathered up all the weapons, Jason sat down and organized his thoughts. He kept his eyes off to the side of the girl, not looking directly at her exposed body, and asked, "'How do you know English?' She pointed at the old man on the floor and replied, Grandfather from Africa. Well? Well, that explained some things, but the implications were disturbing. It seemed Dolos might have been telling the truth. My name is Jason. What is your name? My name, Marine. Jason struggled with how to ask his... Jason struggled with... Jason struggled with how to ask his next question. Marine, how did you heal that man? Marine didn't understand the question, as evidenced by a shake of her head. Jason tried again. Man sick. Now not sick. You did? Ah, Marine nodded. Grandfather, she shrugged and... Uh, she shrugged and said, I am magic. You mean you used magic? I used magic. Body magic. Marine, can you help that boy over there? 
Jason pointed at the corpse of the boy on the floor of the cave. Moraine glanced over, but quickly looked away and began to quietly sob. Jason let her have a few moments. Marine shook her head. Boycon! Jason wanted to ask more questions, but Henry laid a hand on his shoulder. Jason immediately understood. They needed to get away from the cave. Fast. There was no telling whether more goblins might show up. After the men gathered anything that looked useful, including the boss goblin's bronze sword, Marine helped them haul their makeshift weapons while Jason carried her grandfather in a fireman's carry. They made pretty good time at first, probably because their bodies were still pumped full of adrenaline. Henry led the way back the direction they'd come on the goblin trail. Jason was tired and confused. He whispered, Henry, why are we going this way? His friend whispered back, Tracks. We can't make a new trail from the cave. Jason nodded. Luckily, they didn't see any more goblins. They turned off the path into the forest a little way past the clearing where... They turned off the path into the forest a little way past the clearing where... Oops, no. They turned off the path into the forest a little way past the clearing where Henry and Jason had first found the goblin trail. Then they walked about a quarter mile before lying down to watch the way they'd come. Marine busied herself tending to her grandfather behind them. Jason was still shaky, but he gradually forced himself to calm down, approaching the situation like a programming pro <laughs> Jason was still shaky, but he gradually forced himself to calm down, approaching the situation like a programming problem. He needed to frame everything with logic so he could rationally process what had happened. He was about to ask Marine if she could fight with magic, but... He was about to ask Marine if she could fight with magic, but answered his own question. If she could, she wouldn't have been captured. It irritated him that Henry probably hadn't asked because he'd already come to that conclusion. He glanced over at Henry and noticed his friend looked bored. That figures. Uh-oh. I turned my... That was uncalled for, iPad. How dare you, iPad? I turned your sound off, and you're still doing things like beeping? Maybe. Oh, that's right, the ringer. Okay. okay. Nothing ever seemed to affect Henry in any way other than temporarily pissing him off. He sighed. Jason still felt like a bucket of raw nerves, but he managed to slow his breathing. It was quiet in the forest other than the sound of Marine whispering to her grandfather. They waited for about half an hour in breathless anticipation. Jason tightly gripped the late goblin boss's bronze sword, but nothing happened. No new goblins came screaming out of the trees. Eventually, Henry tapped Jason on the shoulder and whispered, We should get going. Best I can figure. Marine says her home is probably a few miles from here going downhill. Jason nodded tiredly. Bleh. Jason nodded tiredly. Once again, the two men and Marine gathered everything up. This time, Jason carried Marine's grandfather. It was slow going. Walking downhill while carrying heavy weight, especially over uneven terrain, was exhausting. After about half a mile, Jason switched with Henry. After that, they switched off every quarter mile or so. Through his exhaustion, Jason blearily wondered if the day got dark or whether the trees were just blocking most of the light. He could hardly see where he was going. In fact, the next two hours were a blur. Jason concentrated on putting one foot in front of the other. He was so tired, so very, very tired. He just wanted to lie down and rest. 
No. He had to keep going. He knew the woman with them and the old man he was carrying were depending on him. He wouldn't let them down. He would never let anyone down again. He'd already let his mom down enough when he was a kid. He had to take that shame to his grave, but he refused to add any more to it as long as he had any strength left in him. By the time the old man woke up, Jason was so tired he was practically sleepwalking. He couldn't remember if anything was said. It was possible he heard people talking. It was possible he even spoke himself, but he couldn't remember. The only thing that really registered before he passed out was excited people carrying lights. Maybe torches, he wasn't sure. And helping him the rest of the way to where he was finally able to collapse in a heap. Jason dreamt that goblins were driving race cars and kept running into things. He had to keep fixing everything they destroyed with magic. <laughs> Another chapter done. Oh, yeah. Action chapter. With some trolls. We had a troll. Daniel Jackson, the troll. That was really funny. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm kind of bummed you, you kicked him already. I mean, maybe he, maybe he was actually saying some things. Maybe it was code to get more, view, <laughs> more viewers here. I'm just kidding. That guy, that guy needed to go. I'm going to go get some water. I will be right back. Oh. So, in this next chapter, we get to meet George, and this is going to be interesting for me because I have not used South African accent yet in any audiobooks, so I, I did a little bit of research, um, and I actually have a tiny bit of an edge here, it feels like, because back in high school, I had an acting teacher who was South African, and I always, I was always fascinated with her accent, so I paid kind of a lot of attention to it, and I would uh, imitate it sometimes. So I do okay with it. Um, I didn't have to work too hard to get it to work, but uh, there's a lot of language stuff in this in this book, and I, I wish there was an easier way to uh, to display it. Like there's a lot of there's like a lot of babblefish stuff going on, you know, where where um, people are talking in different languages, but we still are reading it in English. I still have to narrate in English. So um, I decided the least confusing way to do it would be to simply keep everyone's accents and voices consistent and just allow the narration to take care of telling the listener what language they're actually talking in and everything. I mean, because if I tried, e even if I managed to come up with a system that was manageable for me to figure out, to keep consistent myself, I think it would probably be even more confusing for the listener for things to keep shifting that way. So I'm going to, I'm going to just, for each character, I'm at least going to voice them 
relatively consistently uh, as far as that's concerned. But um, at least uh, the, the one thing about today's today's stream that I regret a little bit is that the first the first few chapters of this book don't have as many of the colorful characters. Um, George is. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we get to meet George here, but um, we get so many more interesting characters later on in the book. Uh, so, um, but yeah, that's why I'm I'm excited about this particular chapter, and I think the next chapter is even better, more, even more George. Oh, and I hope we get to we get to a surprise character that. I was so happy to see in this book because I'm a big fan of his already before the book came out. That's right. <clears throat> I think some of you might know who I'm... I think a couple of you might know who I'm talking about. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for looking out. Uh, all right. The village. <laughs> Henry woke up and stared at the ceiling for a moment before he remembered everything that had happened. He was currently lying on a rustic, handmade bed in a cabin made of rough-hewn logs. He glanced over and saw Jason still asleep on another bed, slightly drooling. Henry shook his head and wearily rolled his eyes. He got up and winced. His entire body felt like a bunch of little gnomes had beaten him with miniature baseball bats for an hour straight. At least I'm alive, the thought was cold comfort. At least we killed the little... At least we killed the evil little fuckers. He grinned nastily. That thought made him feel better. He and Jason were alone. He wandered around for... Wondered. Because I'm a wanderer. Yes, I'm a wanderer. He and Jason were alone. He wandered around for a while, trying to figure out how to deal with his call of nature until he found an outhouse behind the building. After relieving himself, he found the duffel bag and his equipment at the front of the house. He sat down to think for a while, then took... Where'd he go? Where'd he go? He sat down to think for a while, then took out the mysterious box with the spheres again. He reread the notes from Dolos and stared into space, thinking about the two mysterious balls that had come with the letter. Eventually, Jason stumbled out of the house, yawning. He winced and asked, Does your whole body hurt too? Henry nodded. Yeah. Fighting for your life tends to have that effect. Jason stretched and asked, Is there a toilet anywhere? Henry mutely pointed re rearwards. Pointed rewards. Showed him his outhouse rewards card. Henry mutely pointed rearwards with a thumb and went back to pondering their situation. By the looks of things, it was getting on to late afternoon, almost twilight. He had j he and Jason. He and Jason had slept a while, but not as long as he'd first thought. Either that or days on this new world were different, which was a diff- Either that or days on this new world were different, which was a definite possibility. He decided to shelve the matter for the time being. One thing was painfully clear. If he and Jason were ever going to get home, they had to get stronger. They also needed intel. Badly. When Jason got back home f back home. When Jason got back from the outhouse, Henry told him what was on his mind. 
Jason said, Yes, I was thinking the same thing. We almost died for real. We'd probably be better off if we could just look the other way and mind our own business, but apparently that isn't going to happen. Henry scratched his chest and said, Yet, knowing you, you probably have an idea. Jason grinned. You bet. I want to let it sit for a while, though. Let's find out how... Let's find out about how magic works in this world and about the races mentioned in the note before we make any decisions. Henry nodded. That made sense. He wasn't surprised. Over the years, he and Jason had figured out each other's strengths and weaknesses. When it came to quick thinking, being decisive, Henry had the edge. But with long-term strategy, Jason was like a fish to water. In fact, Jason had mentioned before that he'd played chess in high school. In fact, Jason had mentioned before that he'd played chess in high school and was actually pretty good. The two friends got up and began to wander around, their sore muscles making them shuffle like zombies. Henry quickly realized that the cottage they'd woken up in was one of ah. Henry quickly realized that the cottage they'd woken up in was one of several small buildings. It looked like a few fan Where is my head right now? It looked like a few families had settled down in the area. Once he realized what sort of place their hosts led them to, he tried figuring out where all the people had gone. Jason accompanied him, accompanied him, accompany for some reason is a hard one for me. Jason, 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 Jason accompanied him as he explored and they eventually found everyone in a large house at the center of the clearing. They could hear the sounds of voices before ever actually seeing anyone. The door to the large cottage was open, and when he glanced in, Henry could see a group of people sitting down while two men stood talking. It looked like a town meeting of some kind. Henry tapped Jason on the shoulder and put his finger to his lips. Motorcycle outside. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> it looked like a town meeting of some kind. Henry tapped Jason on the shoulder and put his finger to his lips, and his tall, gangly friend nodded. They both wanted to observe for a while. After paying closer attention, Henry could see that one of the men standing up and addressing the rest of the group was the old man they'd rescued from the goblin cave. The other man had swarthy skin and looked about the same... The other man had swarthy skin and looked about the same age, but while Marine's grandfather was calmly speaking, the other man was angry, yelling and gesturing violently. Henry watched the crowd and counted about a dozen other adults and a few children. Henry watched the crowd and counted about a dozen other adults and a few children present. He caught a glimpse of Marine in the crowd. He was glad he seemed safe and healthy, she seemed. He was glad she seemed safe and healthy, but he noticed she looked worried. He wished he understood what was being said, but everyone was speaking in un... Oh boy. He wished he understood what was being said, but everyone was speaking an unfamiliar language. To his ears, it sounded like a cross between German and Spanish. However, he knew he sucked with languages so his guess probably wasn't the best. After his grandmother had moved to the United States, she'd been appalled that his father never taught him a Jap- <clears throat> After his grandmother had moved to the United States, she'd been appalled that his father never taught him Japanese. She had immediately spent a few years trying to remedy the oversight. By that time, it was already too late, though. Henry could speak just enough Japanese to know how bad he was at it. Ah, what is up with me today? 
Henry could speak just enough Japanese to know how bad he was at it. He definitely would never have called himself bilingual. As he watched, one of the children glanced over and gasped. She excitedly... She excitedly tugged on her mother's skirt and pointed at Henry and Jason standing outside. Then her mother said something, and the town meeting stopped. Marine and her grandfather walked outside while some of the villagers watched from inside the building. Most were curious, but others were obviously afraid. The old man that had been arguing with Marine's grandfather glared at them. Marine's dark brown hair bounced as she came to a stop, and her green eyes twinkled. She was wearing a clean, plain dress that looked made of cotton. I got that right. She greeted them with broken English. You awake now? Good. Her grandfather patted her on the shoulder and said in accented English, Yeah, you two were sleeping for such a long time that we were beginning to worry. Beginning to worry. Ugh. Oh, he hello, new person. Senizal, thank you for joining us. I don't know who you are, but I appreciate you attending. All right. So, for some reason, I have a, a little bit of a harder time doing the South African accent with this particular voice, but I can do it. Don't you judge me. All right. Yeah. You two were sleeping for such a long time that we were beginning to worry. Well, I suppose it's fair. You did clean out an entire goblin cave by yourselves. I'm assuming you just got to this... I'm assuming you just got to this world too. You just got to this world too. I'm assuming. I'm... I'm assuming. I'm assuming you just got to this world, too. This one's a hard one. I'm assuming... I'm... That's Irish. I'm assuming you just got to this world, too. I'm assuming you just got to this world. I'm assuming you just got to this world, too. I'm assuming you just got to this world, too. Ah, where are my manners? My name is George. As George shook hands with them, As George shook hands with him and Jason, Henry mentally shook his head. He didn't know how long he'd been out, but seeing George and Maureen behaving somewhat normally despite the ordeal they'd just gone through meant these must be very tough people. Maureen's healing magic probably had no way to fix emotional trauma. Then again, he was currently standing in the middle of a village in a fantasy world. These people would have to be tough to survive. While Henry pondered the people they'd rescued, he heard Jason say, Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, George. I'm Jason, and my grumpy friend here is Henry. I'm glad somebody around here speaks English. Is it? I've actually been drawn to Marine in English when you were sleeping, so I could be a little rusty. Damn, a little less rusty. I've actually been drawn to Marine in English when you were sleeping, so I could be a little less rusty, you know? Whole thing making me a lost cop today, you know? It's been about ten years since I spoke with someone else like you lot. You can probably tell by my accent that I'm not from the United States like you, you know? I can still recognize that accent, for sure. I was from South Africa and working in Brazil before I was taken to this... place. George's smile dropped. That's been over thirty years. Henry cocked his head. There are some... There are more of us here in our... There are more of us here from our world? All humans on this place are from Earth. Dolos has been taking us here for... Dolos has been taking us here. Dolos has been taking us here for thousands of years from what I know. Right now, there are not too many. Right now, right now. Right now, there are two. There are two. Right now. <laughs> uh. Right now, there are. There are too many. 
Right now, there are not too many people still living that remember the Earth, but more than you might think. Right now, there are not too... They are not... Right now, there are not too many people still living that remember the Earth, but more than you might think. Of course, we are from all over the fucking place on Earth, and scattered all over on this planet, so... Jason nodded and said, It's probably hard to keep in touch. So, what is your meeting about? I am actually mayor of this village. Well, close enough. George frowned. The majority of us want to move. This new goblin mess driving home how dangerous this can... This new goblin mess driving home how dangerous this area become. And there are not enough of us to protect the place. Protect. And there are not enough of us to protect... And there are not enough of us to protect the place. And there are not enough of us to protect... Ah. And there are not enough of us to protect the place. Not everyone is happy, you know. Actually, if you could wait for us back at my house where you woke up, me and Maureen should be done soon. We can talk more, then, just now. We can talk more, then, just now. George's rusty English combined with his accent was a little confusing, but Henry knew a polite dismissal when he heard one. He swatted Jason on the arm and began s He swatted Jason on the arm and began heading back. He thought about their situation while he walked and realized he and Jason were flying blind. Jason whispered, Hey, I thought I saw a book with Hey, I thought I saw a book with English written on it in the house before we left. Let's go take a look before Jer- <sighs> Let's go take a look before George and Maureen get back. Henry nodded. After they got back to the rough house, Jason showed Henry where he'd seen the written English. It looked like an old, battered, handwritten journal sitting on a rough shelf with a small number of other books. Henry flipped the book open, and the first things he saw were a date at the top of the page, lines of blocky handwriting, and old watermarks. He was suddenly struck with a feeling like he was introdu introducing, intruding. He was suddenly struck. <clears throat> uh, RRL. What is what is RRL? Senizal. He was where? He was. He was suddenly struck with a feeling like he was intruding on memories without permission and glanced up. His eyes met Jason's, and his friend said, Let's put it back. Henry nodded. They needed information badly, but he wasn't about to go rooting around someone's diary or journal during his first day or two. Royal Road. Got it. They needed information badly. Ah. Uh, the stool's starting to hurt my butt. They needed information badly, but he wasn't about to go rooting around someone's diary or journal during his first day or two. Ah, same, same exact mistake. I'm glad my computer's hiccuping now, instead of in the middle of something. They needed information badly, but he wasn't about to go rooting around someone's diary or journal during his first day or two on a new world. He was not desperate enough yet to be that kind of... that big of a shitbag. God. He was not desperate enough yet to be that big of a shitbag. Henry walked outside to sit down, and Jason followed. He scratched his goatee and said, I have seen you looking off into the distance a few times. And I know that look. What are you thinking? Since we're alone right now, 
This is probably the best time to talk without anyone listening in. Jason replied. I've been thinking about that note on... I've been thinking about the note that Dolos left. I think we should take it literally. He found the note in the duffel and read it out loud again. Each device will confer one magic type of your choosing, as well as the ability to understand all languages on Luda. When you are ready to accept your blessing from the great god Dolos, swallow one device and think of the magic you wish to learn all day and right before you fall asleep. Jason folded the note and put it back in the duffel. He said, If we take this note seriously, and at this point we have no reason not to, we can logically assume a few things. Henry paid close attention. He had a lot of respect for his friend's power of insight, as well as Jason's superior background in fantasy and science fiction. Who'd have known that Jason's geeky hobbies might possibly save their lives one day? Jason continued, We are at a huge disadvantage right now in that we don't speak the local language. We were incredibly lucky to meet another English speaker in our first day or two here, and also that we are in a relatively uninhabited area. Henry scrunched up his forehead and asked, What do you mean? Think about it. If these orbs just do what the note says they'll do, they're incredibly valuable. What happens to tourists carrying pockets full of money in rough areas of foreign countries? Mm, that could be better. What happens to tourists carrying... What happens to tourists carrying pockets full of money in rough areas of foreign countries? Henry immediately understood. He'd seen firsthand what happened when people carrying valuables were not wary enough. He made a circular motion with his hand and urged, Go on. So, not only did we luck out with the language issue, but we're still alive and nobody has stolen our stuff. We also have a little bit of time before making a decision on how to use these orbs. That said, I think we should do as... That said, I think we should do so as quickly as possible. What if they do something messed up? What if they do something messed up to us, like change us into lizards or something? Asked Henry. He really didn't trust Dolos and didn't like situations where he had to go... He really didn't trust Dolos and didn't like situations where he had to make important decisions with so little to go on. Jason said, that's a fair point, and why I think we should pump our hosts for as much information as possible after they get back. We did save their lives, and they seem like pretty nice people. At the very least, they should be willing to answer a few questions. Okay, that makes sense. But what else are you thinking? I know there has to be more, or you wouldn't be making such a big deal about this. Yes, Jason, said Jason. Said Jason. He looked oddly excited. Think about it, Henry. Magic. Real-life magic. We've actually seen it, and the note implied there are different types of magic we could choose. This is the part I've actually been thinking about the most. Based on what we've seen so far, this world is similar in some ways to RPG games I've played on Earth. The monsters have seemed similar so far. The entire setting is a variation of things I'm familiar with. If this is a sword and sorcery world, there are going to be several types of magic. This jives with what the note suggests, too. Henry frowned. He hadn't seriously thought about that portion of the note yet, despite witnessing Marine use healing magic. The whole situation was fucked up. He realized he needed to be more flexible and more open-minded. He could do that. He said, Okay, dude, I get your point. Now where are you going with this? Jason grinned, tapping the ground near where he was sitting. I think what type of magic we choose will be critical. So before we make that decision, we need to know what types of magic there are and how popular or com- Damn. So before we make that decision, we need to know what types of magic there are and how popular or common each is. Why? Because we want to choose uncommon types. Okay, you lost me. Jason's expression got more serious, and he said, Look, our goal is to pretty much take over the whole world. That's nuts. It's crazy. But I'm trying to focus on the solution. Realistically, in order to accomplish anything even close to that amazing in our lives, much less avoid getting killed, 
we need all the advantages we can get. Right now, the greatest advantage we have is that we are humans from 21st century Earth. Henry shook his head. He was willing to hear Jason out, but nothing was making sense yet. He said, Yeah, but we just heard there are other people from Earth here. No, you don't get it. Technology and culture has advanced exponentially in the last 40 years on Earth. The odds of there being that many modern Earthlings here is slim, or we would have heard... Or we would have heard about... Or we would have heard... Or we would have heard... Damn it. Or we would have heard about more disappearances back home. I think we can definitely think of this as an advantage because we are going to think about things differently than other people. It gives us an advantage. Just trust me on this. Henry slowly asked. All right. So what about the magic? Jason smiled and said, What's more surprising than choosing one of the least popular magics on purpose? Furthermore, any kind of power is only limited by one's creativity. Think about it, man. Before someone invented the water wheel, a stream couldn't be used to grind wheat, could it? The ancient Chinese turned fireworks into a weapon. I don't know, dude. I still don't get it. But I don't have any... I, I don't know, dude. I still don't get it. But I don't have any better ideas. So I'm going to trust you on this. Okay, good to hear. Now, there are only two other things we need to find out from our hosts ASAP, and they're both obviously important. One is the other races. I'm guessing... I'm guessing this means species, not human races. I've seen several ethnicities of people in this village. I've seen several ethnicities of people in this village. I need to know where humans fit in this world. As for the other one... Did you notice there weren't any metal tools in this village? Yeah, replied Henry. I saw a bunch of wooden and stone tools, but not really any metal. It was weird. Jason gestured behind him through the doorway in the cavern. Cavern. That's a cavern with a wood door. Jason gestured behind him through the doorway in the cabin. If you look around, you won't see any steel or iron anywhere. Just a little bit of tin and some copper. You can tell by the green oxidization. Henry thought about the inside of the cabin and realized Jason was right. Okay. What do you think is going on? Jason answered, I have no idea, but I bet it's related somehow to the fact we haven't seen any technology. We should be seeing at least some crude electric. We should be seeing at least some crude electric tools if people have been brought here from Earth in the last few decades. Dolos made it sound like he's been doing this forever. It doesn't take a genius to run a magnet around a wire. You're right. Henry was impressed. Jason may have been a goofy bastard, but he had a good head on his shoulders in stressful situations. Okay, let's. Okay, let's recap what we need to find out. Jason ticked off the listed items on his fingers. First, we need to find out about the orbs that Dolos gave us. First, we need to find out what the orbs that Dolos gave us. First, we need to find out about the orbs that Dolos gave us. Then we need to learn about the magic in this world. Next, we need to ask about the different races of people on this planet. Last, we need to... Last, we need to a... Last, we need to ask where all the steel is at. Is at. N <laughs> Last, we need to ask where all the steel is at and why there is no technology. Okay, dude. Sounds like a plan. Now all we have to do is wait for our hosts to get back. Sitting on the front steps of the cabin, they did exactly that. Henry was looking forward to making sense of the strange new world they were in. He was glad Jason had come up with such a simple but important list of questions to ask. 
He was lost in his own thoughts and rested in silence until George and Marine came back. Woo! Chapter. Chapter done. <coughs> no. <coughs> no, that's not how we roll, Lau. Necro rules. <laughs> <coughs> no, Lau. Woof. There's an intruder, apparently. Whew. Had to let this place air out a little bit. My butt is seriously getting kind of... Ah! Yikes. Oh, hey, Sin. Ugh. My butt gets more tired than my feet do. I mean, comparing stools to standing. I think it's because my butt is particularly bony. Maybe. Yeah, how far are we in? About almost two hours. We're 8% into the book. Maybe I will, I don't know. Uh, well, if I, if I stand up, which is what I'm used to, um, then actually I shift around on my feet and the, the whole, it transfers through the whole booth and it causes like a vibration that's kind of bassy and it sometimes, in, uh, creates noise in my recordings. So that's why, that's why I started, uh using a stool. I do prefer standing, but this stool is actually pretty good because it, the bottom is rounded instead of, it doesn't, it doesn't have legs, it's got a rounded bottom, so I actually have to keep my spine straight uh, to stay sitting up. Um, and that, that keeps, that's what I didn't like about sitting is my posture could easily start uh, deteriorating and then that collapses my diaphragm, and I just don't like that. <clears throat> uh, this booth is one I bought. It's uh, actually, if you go to, um, if you look up um, Studio Bricks, it's, um, it's basically a uh, recording studio that you can put together like Legos. It's pretty damn cool. I'm so glad to have it. It saves me so much time because it kills it kills noise so much better than I literally was in my closet in my office and uh that was miserable. Yeah, you can. Um you can buy them just like their sheds in the backyard and uh they're just expensive. Be prepared to spend a lot of money. This one actually got used. So I paid half what I was going to for a brand new one. <clears throat> Alright. More George. The world. By the time Henry heard footsteps approaching, it was almost dark. He figured about an hour had passed. When he could actually see George and Marine approaching, they both looked tired and frustrated. George slowed as he saw Henry and Jason sitting outside, and his face changed into a genuine smile. Ach, shame. Ach, shame. Ach, shame. I don't want the just ach, ach. Uh, 
Oh, I bought it used from, yeah, another VO artist here in Kansas City. That was very convenient. <laughs> ah, shame. Sorry I had to be so short with you two earlier. Ah, no, that's like old Mexican guy. Oh, that's the uh, garage door again, my roommate's coming back in from wherever she was going. You gotta get back in the South Af South 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 African. Ah, shame. Sorry I had to be so short with you too earlier. I wouldn't even be alive here right now if it weren't for you. Right now, right now. I wouldn't even be alive here right right now if it weren't for you. Ah, shame. Sorry I had to be so short with you too earlier. I wouldn't even be he alive here right now if it weren't for you. He's got a video of me in the closet. It's so claustrophobic. Like, I literally did not have room to move. I could not move. Like, I would have to, like, do this with everything. Like, I couldn't flare my el elbows out. <clears throat> Just waiting for her to close the garage door one more time. Yeah, but it's frustrating when people drag out things that should be obvious. When I give someone a snot clap. When I give someone a snot clap. You probably saw the man in the meeting. Well, problem is, he can't, I, can't, I can't even be mad at him. Because I'm mad too. Hold on, Senazal. Senazal says, I always scream out the lines when reading climaxes. Very hard to suppress. Like, when you're writing, you scream them out? Like, ah! Ugh, shame. Sorry I had to be so short with you two earlier. I wouldn't even be alive here right now if it weren't for you. Ah, oh, that right, right now, right now. I wouldn't even be alive here right now if it weren't for you. Henry didn't fault the man for taking care of his village's business. He replied, Don't worry about it. It's not like you can just drop your responsibilities. Nobody should. George sighed as he walked past and waved them inside the house. Yeah, but it's frustrating when people drag out things that should be obvious. Wanna give someone a snot clap? Wanna give someone a snot clap? You probably saw the man in the meeting. Well, problem is I can't even... Can't even be... My, ah, well, problem is... <laughs> uh, you guys are funny. Well, problem is I can't even be mad at him. Because I'm mad too. See, his name is Perry. And it was his son you saw dead in the cave yesterday. Henry thought to himself, yesterday. Well, that proves this is a new day. We must have had a nasty case of interstellar jet lag. As Henry and Jason took seats around the cabin's main room, Jason settled his tall frame, running a hand through his unruly hair, and asked, You said the meeting was about moving, right? Wouldn't Perry want to move away from the place where his son was just murdered by monsters? It's not that simple. It's not that simple. It's not that simple. It's not that simple. George shook his head a sad... <sighs> George shook his head sadly. Perry wants to find his son Tomas's remains to give him a proper burial. That happenings, that happenings, happenings, that, that, that happenings not likely but it's impossible if the whole village leaves in the next day or two. Then there's that we all spent time and effort building this place. I'm not really happy about giving it up either. I'm not really happy about giving it up either. This place is my home. And I think Perry thinks we're giving up and disrespecting Tomas's memory. 
I feel for the man. But the reality is this area has got too dangerous. George shook his head and hit it. George shook his head and hit his knee in frustration. It feels bad, and it's bitter to all us living here. But we're not strong enough to protect everything. This area is starting This area is starting to crawl. This area is starting to crawl with goblins, and most of us don't know much about fighting. Believe it or not, I'm one of the scrappiest boars in the village, and you saw the state I was in when you found me. When you found me. And you saw the state I was in when they And you saw the state I was in when you found me. Ah. And you saw the state I was in when you found me. Henry was curious and asked, How did you all end up in that cave in the first place? George looked off into the distance, and his face took on the cast of a man. Ah, I didn't even get that wrong. Why did I stop? George looked off into the distance, and his face took on the cast of a man with many regrets. I was teaching Thomas how... Bear with me with this guy. I was teaching Tomas how to tend crop. His father uh, asked me. His father asked me. His father asked me to do it because I have a good touch with growing things. We were in one of the fields when Marine came out to bring us water, and the goblins surrounded us. After that, the goblins took us to the cave, and you found us. Henry felt like an asshole for making George drop. Henry felt like an asshole for making George dredge up memories of his capture. I'm sorry for asking. No, brah. I would not be alive to feel bad right now if you didn't save my life. George snorted. <laughs> if answering questions is the price of my life, I'll pay it. Jason cleared his throat. <clears throat> Actually, we do have some questions. Henry internally congratulated Jason. That was very smooth. He admired how Jason could slip into a conversation like that. Henry knew there was little finesse to his own conversational skills. George sat back and shrugged. I figured you would have some questions for me. Larry, I remember how confused I was when I first came to Ludus. Without warning, Jason took the box with the orbs out from behind where he was sitting. Without warning, Jason took the box with the orbs out from behind where he was sitting. He flipped it open and asked, Do you know anything about these? George's reaction was far more extreme than Henry had been expecting. When he saw the orbs, the old man's dark skin turned a shade paler. He immediately jumped up to shut the door and then hissed, Yo! Don't go waving those around! Don't let anyone see them! You should either use them... You should either use them... You should... You should either use them quick or hide it away! Henry spoke up. So they're valuable, huh? George kept his voice down, but growled. Yeah. Nee even the... Yeah. Yeah. Nee even the most cowardly person in this place could be tempted to do something stupid to get their hands on them. They all have different effects, but all of them make people healthier, live longer. Not all newbies to this world... Not all newbies to this world come with orbs... But they all give people abilities. Put that away. Caught a big scrick. Caught a big scrick. Caught a big scrick. I forgot to look up what it what it. <clears throat> I forgot to look up what caught a big scrick means. Caught a big scrick. George shook his head. I kind of expected you to already... Oh, wait, no. Skip this paragraph. Jason carefully closed the box and placed it behind him again. What kind of abilities? George shook his head. I kind of expected you to already look through this thing, yeah? I suppose I shouldn't be surprised you're honorable. Then George grunted as he got up and retrieved the journal Henry and Jason had seen before. Henry glanced at Maureen in the corner while George headed back to his seat. The girl hadn't said anything yet, probably because she didn't speak English very well, 
but she looked worried. George seemed to be... Blaze says, it means I got a big fright. I caught a big skrick. I caught a big skrick. Let's see if that sounded right. Caught a big skrick. Caught a big skrick. There we go. George seemed to deflate a bit as he sat back down and said, I should have known I'd have to get this book anyway. It has thirty years worth of Ludus information in it, and I would not want to give the ro It ha it has thirty years worth of Ludus information in it, and I would not want to give you the wrong information, especially since you saved me. Henry thought of something before George could continue. Eh. Henry thought of something before George could get in. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's funny. Might make him narrate. <laughs> make him go coin operated. Henry thought of something before George could con George could continue. Henry thought of something before George could con could continue could continue. Henry thought of something before George could continue. He asked. If the orbs if the orbs are so valuable, if the orbs are so valuable and newbies to this <clears throat> If the orbs are so valuable, and newbies to this planet can have them, why haven't any other villagers come near your house while we've been around? Damn. If the orbs are so valuable, and newbies to this planet can have them, why haven't any other villagers come near your house while we've been here, especially since we were passed out? Seems people might want to look through our stuff. Well... For one, they're afraid of you. You killed a link of goblins, after all. You killed a link of goblins, after all. You killed a link of goblins, after all. Well, for one... No. But we completely caught them by surprise, protested Jason. If it was a fair fight, we wouldn't have stood a chance. If it was a fair fight, we wouldn't have stood a chance. George chuckled. <laughs> the people living here don't know that. Plus, none of them have ever killed a goblin. Despite everything, you two took out half a dozen, yeah? Can you really not understand why they'd be nervous? George gave a sly look. Plus, why do you think I called the town meeting so quick? With everyone there... I could keep eyes on everyone. Couldn't let anyone do something doff when you two saved Maureen. Jason cleared his throat and said, We appreciate that. I didn't clear my throat. I didn't follow directions. <clears throat> we appreciate that. So, like I asked before, what do these orbs do? Let's see. George leafed through his book and said, Some give strength, some speed. All of them make the owner healthy. Most of them increase a person's lifespan. He tapered off and flipped through a few more pages. A few give magic of some kind. A few give energy powers. But these were mostly to non-humans. Henry's ears perked up at that, but he kept his mouth shut. He trusted Jason to do most of the talking during this conversation. Someone outside. Okay. 
Jason pinched the bridge of his nose and said, I'm assuming you did a lot of your own research over the last few decades. This is my life's work, George pointed at the book. When I first got here, not only did someone steal my orb in my first couple hours here, I didn't even know this was another world for almost a week. For almost a week, did that come out right? Nope. I didn't even know this was another world for almost a week. First few years were rough. You guys lucky you didn't wind up somewhere with people that would kill you for orbs. You guys lucky you didn't wind up somewhere with people that would kill you for the orbs. Jason asked. Wait, didn't Dolos... Wait, didn't Dolos tell you that you were on an... Wait, didn't Dolos tell you that you were on another world? George looked shocked. In the corner, Marine gasped. George leaned forward and softly asked, Ah, you met Dolos? Henry felt his expression souring, and he saw Jason about to answer, but he beat him to the punch. Before he could think through, Oops. Wasn't recording. There we go. Henry felt his expression souring, and he saw Jason about to answer, but he beat him to the punch. Before he could think it through, he said, Yeah, and I told him to go fuck himself. He saw Jason wince. Well, Henry knew he wasn't very good at keeping quiet when he should. Like now, and when he was talking to a huge man floating in the air. He shrugged. George's mouth hung open, and he blinked. Marine looked like she wanted to run away. George stammered, Hybo, not many love Dolos on this planet other than those that worship him, but he is rarely seen. He destroyed entire towns that pissed him off. He doesn't usually come in person to new people on Ludus, and it's usually only for people who end up becoming famous. Who are you, brah? Henry shrugged again and said, Henry shrugged again and said, I'm an EMT, and Jason is a programmer. We like fencing. No big deal. Where'd it go? Jason sighed and asked, What can you tell us about magic? Henry realized his friend was trying to bring the conversation back to the topics they wanted to cover, so he reminded himself to keep his mouth shut. George was still visibly shaken, but asked, Magic? Yes, we were shocked when we saw a Marine using magic. I mean, you are from Earth, so you probably know how we... You are... Oops... Where'd it go? I mean, you are from Earth, so you probably know how we felt. What can you tell us about magic on this world? George seemed to calm down and flipped through his book. Ah, you sure are lucky, Chinas. Ah, you sure are lucky, Chinas. Most people will be able to tell you a little about magic, but to get good answers, to, but to get good answers. But to get good answers, you'd usually have to buy an expensive book or talk to... But to get good answers, you sh... <laughs> Where'd it go? Where'd it go? But to get good answers, but to get good answers, you'd usually have to buy an expensive book or talk to a mage. Lucky for you, I researched about magic in the past. George was quiet for a minute while he tried to find the right page. Here it is. There are seven schools of magic and seven subschools. 
all organized in pairs, school and sub-school. People usually only have a head for... People usually only have a head for one school or sub-school of magic, but they can use whatever school or sub-school their magic is paired with. So, like, the life school is used for healing and is a sub-school of water. Marina's good with life magic, so she can use a little bit of water magic, but not much. She can't use any other kind. All mages have different strengths and abilities. Spells are different, too. Mages all do everything different. Nobody knows how people become mages either, or how... Nobody knows how people become mages either, or why some people can sense magic and some can't. Damn it. Nobody knows how people become mages either, or why some people can. Nobody knows how people become mages either, or why some people can sense magic and some can't. Henry was glad that George's English was getting better. What? Better. Henry was glad that George's English was getting better. He could only imagine how much harder that explanation could have been to understand if George was still talking the way he'd been when they met him earlier that day. I don't, let me see if I said that right. He could only imagine how much harder that explanation could have been to understand if George was still talking the way he'd been when they met him. Ah, damn it. He could only imagine how much harder that explanation could have been to understand if George was still talking the way he'd been when they met him earlier that day. There we go. What are all the schools of magic? asked Jason. Also, do you have a piece of paper and something to write on? Marine got up wordlessly. And wordlessly. Marine got up and wordlessly handed Jason a piece of parchment and a small, crude pencil from... Marine got up and wordlessly handed Jason a piece of parchment and a small, crude pencil made from a twig. George consulted his journal, and then listed off the schools of magic and their sub-schools. School, sub-school. Earth, metal. Air, <clears throat> sorry, let me try that again. <clears throat> Blaze says, every time Jeff has a problem saying something, it makes me feel like an ass for writing it. Um, sometimes that's valid, sometimes it's not. You gotta write what you mean, but listening to someone read aloud helps you, helps you hear what people hear in their head when they're reading it, and rhythm is important as a writer, so. Sometimes it's just the nature of it and it can't be helped. Sometimes it's like, huh, it could be worded better, right? But don't think about it too much when you're writing. Just... What you should do is read aloud after you're done writing something so that you can catch those things yourself. What is that? There's something that clicks in my booth once in a while and I can't find it. Okay. So these are the magic schools. <laughs> oh, Jason. Okay. Sc school. Subschool. Earth, metal. Air, void. Water, life. Fire, matter. Consciousness, time. Light, darkness. Force, attraction. Jason scribbled madly on his little parchment, and when he looked up, he asked, Which schools are most popular? Which have the most prestige? Prestige, prestige. Which have the most prestige? George closed his book and scratched his chin. He said, That is a good question. There does seem to be some kind of choice or something with mages, because most of them end up as one of the four elementals. <sighs> By our... <laughs> there does seem to be some kind of choice or something with mages, because most of them end up as one of the four elemental schools. It's not common to be a mage of one of the three higher schools. What do you mean? Well, George continued, 
Most mages have strongest magic with one of the four main element schools. Elemental schools. God damn it. Most mages have strongest magic with one of the four element... Most mages have strongest magic with one of the four main elemental schools. Earth, air, fire, and water. It's rare for... It's rare for anyone. It's rare for anyone to be a sub-school mage. It's even more rare for anyone to be a mage of a higher school. Force, consciousness, and light. You can probably guess that the sub-schools for the three higher schools are pretty much never seen. With most mages, the most common schools are water and air. It's very important to clean water and make water appear out of nowhere. It's also good to fly and control the air. The most common sub-school is life, like marine. Marine smiled and gave a little bow with her head. Okay, said Jason slowly. How does magic work? George looked serious. Best I can tell. And I only got the idea from reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I think it has to do with probability. So, like, fire mages have an easier time making fire if there is already a flame nearby. Water mages have an easier time creating more water if they already have bur Damn. Water mages have an easier time creating more water if they already have water around. Life mages have an easier time healing a strong person. That makes sense. Jason said. Okay, my next question is about the races on this world. Jason paused and looked at another piece of paper. I've heard that there are Ariva, Mohali, Adom, Fideli, and Terrans. George nodded and said, Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. The Ariva say there are actually other races out in the universe, but the most powerful and well-known are all here. The Ariva are like elves. Don't ever say that around them, though. They get mal. They get mal. They get mal. They live really long. They are smaller than us humans, and most of them are smart and crafty as hell. Watch your ass around them just now, yeah? Mohali are animal people. Most of them keep to themselves. They're good chaps, the ones I met. The different types are like castes in humans on Earth. You'll learn which ones have the power if you deal with them. Terrans are like us? Oh, okay. Sorry, that's still him. Terrans are us. From Earth, yeah? Fideli are like Terrans, and a river mixed along... Fideli are like Terrans and Ariva mixed a long, long time ago. Not many of them on Ludus, and most Toon Grief. I forgot to look up what that means, either. That means, too. Toon Grief. T-U-N-E. Grief. Most Toon Grief. Uh. I think maybe it means... Well, uh. Means they go looking for trouble? I don't know. Fideli are always in trouble. You can tell them. You can tell them because they all look like they could live in the dark. They have a white bit in their hair. Adom. Well, you'll probably never see any of them because they are rare. <clears throat> well... Well, you'll probably never see any of them, cause they're rare. But if you see them, they'll stand out. Jason made some more notes. Jason made some more notes and said, Okay, I have one more question. Why is there no metal or technology anywhere? Electricity is death because of the Dolo spots. Dolos has robots that go around sniffing for any electric machines. They destroy it and kill anyone nearby. Nobody chances it. Using electricity is against Dolos' rules. <clears throat> Henry was shocked. Rules against technology? Jason looked floored, too, and stammered, 
What are these rules? George grimaced and replied, It's simple. The only three rules are no electric power, no phase crystal power, and no tree power. Basically, nobody can use the technology from their home planets. The Dolo's bots enforce it. If you break the rules... George drew a thumb across his neck. But... But why? That's crazy. Henry shook his head. Best I can tell, it's to force people to go into dungeons. The only technology we can have... Hef, hef. The only technology we can have uses... Hef. The only technology we can have uses magic stones for power, and all magic stones come from dungeons. Jason rubbed his temples. He said, I don't think I'm ready to hear any more about dungeons right now. My parchment and my brain are full already. What about the other part of my question? Why don't we see much metal around? George shrugged and replied, That's simple, China. Ah. That's simple, China. Iron, iron. Iron and anything with iron in its rot. In it, rot. Iron and anything... Iron and anything... Ugh. Iron and anything with iron in it ro rots. Rots. Iron and anything with iron in it rots crazy fast. Fast. Iron and anything with iron in it rots crazy fast. The only metals anyone can use are bronze and stuff. Damn. The only metals anyone can use are bronze and stuff. Shit's expensive. Henry was confused. He'd looked in the duffel earlier in the day and hadn't seen anything out of the ordinary. He quickly got up and bought... Brought it. That's a typo, definitely. He quickly got up and brought it over before rooting around inside it. Everyone else in the room watched him. He sighed. <sighs> yeah. I didn't notice it before. Oh no, Henry's. It's Henry. <sighs> yeah, I didn't notice it before, but he's sure right about this. He brought out the rifle, which was literally falling apart in his hands. Then he withdrew the cheap steel machete that still looked whole. He asked, What about this, though? George and Marine looked shocked, even more so than when they'd heard Henry and Jason met Dolos. George was quiet for a long time, and finally whispered, Eish, that machete steel has got to be blessed. That thing is worth a fucking fortune. Whew! That's a chapter, man. All right, we got another 20 minutes to a half hour for one more chapter, I think. Oh man, I'm bombed we didn't get to the next chapter after this. I really wanted to do that. Well, let's see, how, how long is this chapter? Yes, it is this chapter. It is this chapter, all right. You know what, guys? I'm going to get one more drink and use the bathroom real quick. I'll be right back. Let's, uh... There we go.
only uh, 1%. That's not cool. Dude, he can't miss this. Why is he watching on his phone anyway? Doesn't he have a computer? Oh. Oh, no, it's, it's not, it wasn't Blaze. Haha. <laughs> All right, last chapter. Oh, okay. using the orbs. The next morning, Jason knew they had to make a decision about the orbs. The little village was packing up that day and leaving the next. He knew that even a chance the orbs could really give them fluency in the look. He knew that even a chance the orbs could really give them fluency in the local language made using them worth a try. The next bef the next before the night before, George had gone on to explain a little bit more about the races on Ludus. Apparently, humans from Earth were shortest lived. Were the shortest lived? Yeah. Typo, typo. Uh, were the shortest. Apparently, humans from Earth were the shortest-lived race on the planet, other than perhaps some of the monsters. Jason also learned that while monsters such as the goblins wandered around, monsters in general were mostly high... <coughs> were most highly concentrated. Monsters. monsters in general were most highly concentrated in and around dungeons. What was more, dungeons always had treasure, usually in the form of magic power stones, amazing equipment, sometimes even things like dolos orbs. Adventurers raided dungeons for treasure in order to make a living. Technology on Ludus required magic stones for power. Without adventurers, people's lives would have been even harder. Adventurers supplied the rest of civil... Adventurers supplied the rest of civilization with power. The concept seemed a little strange to Jason. Jason felt the spark of a long-term plan far farming in his mind. It was growing Brussels sprouts. Jason felt the spark of a long-term plan forming in his mind, but he put it off to think about later. The priority this day was deciding on a school of magic, thinking about it all day and right before bed, and hopefully waking up a mage. He felt a little ridiculous thinking about it, Okay, that sounded like I, I was saying, wake up a mage, like there's a mage sleeping and he needs to wake him up. Waking up a mage. There we go. The priority. the priority this day was deciding on a school of magic, thinking about it all day and right before bed, and hopefully waking up a mage. He felt a little ridiculous thinking about it. When Jason was out of bed and awake, he noticed that Henry was already gone. He rolled his eyes. His friend seemed to have a never-ending supply of energy. After Jason left the cabin, he found Henry sitting outside, uncharacteristically still and looking off at the mountains in the distance. Henry was wearing the same rough extra clothing, courtesy of George, that Jason was... Henry was... Henry was wearing the same rough extra clothing, courtesy of George, that Jason was while their Hema armor was cleaned and dried. However, Henry didn't look ridiculous like Jason did. Jason thought he probably looked like he was wearing children's clothes. Then again, Jason felt... Another typo. Mm. 
Then again, Jason felt awkward wearing anything. He walked up to Henry and asked, Hey, where's everyone else? Henry grunted. Mm. They're getting all the animals ready to move or something. I get the feeling this move has been a long time coming, so lots of people were already ready to go. Jason nodded and thought his friend was probably right. He opened his mouth to speak, but Henry beat him to the punch. I know what you came to talk about. We need to use the orbs, and I've been giving it some thought. I know you think we should choose one of the rare schools, and you can do what you want, but I am not going to. Jason just listened and waited. <clears throat> he knew that he probably wouldn't be able to change Henry's mind, but his friend usually didn't make stupid decisions. Jason knew he was better at overall strategy and seeing a big picture, and he was aware Henry knew this too. However, he respected Henry's insights at times. It was kind of impressive how sometimes Henry could plan several years in advance for specific outcomes in his own life, or so accurately estimate random things. It honestly didn't make a lot of sense. Henry couldn't get anywhere on time to save his life and was terrible with money, but he could build someone a garage within a few dollars of budget and a few hours of estimated build time. Henry continued, I don't think you'll be too mad. <clears throat> I don't think you'll be too mad, because I'm still going to choose one of the less common or at least less popular schools. See, I've been thinking about the dungeons in this world. Realistically, we don't have many ways to make any money, do we? Jason shook his head. I didn't think so. Neither of us are the thieving types, either. I'm figuring you'll suggest we use the dungeons to make money and get equipment, because... <clears throat> I'm figuring you'll suggest we use the dungeons to make. <clears throat> Sorry, I need to not. I need to not like clear my throat while I'm next to the. I'm figuring you'll suggest we use the dungeons to make money and to get equipment because otherwise we won't have a hope in hell of surviving, much less conquering anything. Jason nodded. Henry had seen right through him and already. Motorcycle outside. Jason nodded. Jason nodded. Henry had seen right through him and already figured out what was his... Jason nodded. Henry had seen right through him and already figured... Ah. Uh... Henry had seen right through him and already figured out what his future... Wow. Henry had seen right through him and already figured out what his future plan would be. Who's... Okay. I thought so. That's why I am going... I thought so. That's why I am going to choose earth or metal for my school. If we'll be in caves or underground, it makes sense to choose the school for that element. Plus, before everything in my life went to hell, I was studying to be a geologist, remember? I have a feeling that the more we know about a school of magic, the better off we'll be. Otherwise, people who can do magic naturally on this world wouldn't have affinities in the first place. What do you mean? Well, George said people are usually elemental mages and they tend to be wind or water schools. I'm guessing it's because of what people are used to, what they know. I want to choose a magic school I can master, not just one that is different. Jason could find no fault in Henry's logic. Okay, well, you're going to do what you want anyway. Damn it. Okay, well, you're going to do what you want anyway. Just so you know, I'm planning to take the Consciousness School. I would say that sounds dumb, but I have a feeling you thought of something everyone else missed. Henry frowned. Yep. The Sub-School of Consciousness is time. There are... M Damn. There aren't many Consciousness Mages on Ludus, right? That means information is probably scarce. And what is the opposite of time, or closely linked to it thematically? Henry's eyes widened, and he answered, 
space, right? Exactly. I'm banking on the fact that consciousness is only part of the school's influence. It's only part of the school. Okay. Exactly. I'm banking on the fact that consciousness is only part of the school's influence, that it actually is space, or at least includes it. That's smart. Okay, it sounds like we both know what we're doing, so let's do it. Jason was holding the box with the orbs inside. He opened it up, carefully took one out, and handed the box to Henry. Then he shut his eyes and swallowed the orb. He kept his eyes closed, his body tense, fearing the worst. Nothing happened. He opened his eyes and saw Henry staring back at him. Sometimes you can be such a dramatic pussy, Jason. Jason frowned and he crossed his arms. Oh, I got that right. <sighs> Fuck you, man! I'll tell you what, when we get back, find some other random person to go fighting monsters and ingesting weird pills with. See how well they handle it. Henry rolled his eyes. And yet here you are, still being dramatic. Jason was getting pissed. He hated when Henry needled him like this because the insufferable dick was usually right, too. He had met a few of Henry's army buddies in the past, and they were all like this. They were all assholes, their rough edges almost refined into an art. Whatever, he grunted. We... We walked away? No. Probably he, right? Or they? No, he. He walked away, quickly finding a stick and a shady piece of land. Then he practiced sword swings while he thought... Consciousness slash space magic, over and over again in his head. He didn't know if it was really necessary, but he was not taking any chances. He was going to follow Dolos's. In he was going to follow Dolos's instructions to the letter. Ah. He was going to follow Dolos's instructions to the letter. After exercising, Jason ate a late breakfast of bread and water he found on the table in George's cabin. Then he went to help some of the villagers pack. The whole village was moving all their possessions onto the three... The whole, village. the whole village was moving all their possessions onto the three available wagons. Almost all of the villagers were polite and smiled despite the fact that none of them... Ah! Almost all of the villagers were polite and smiled, despite the fact that none- Damn it. Almost all of the villagers were sp Almost all of the villagers were polite and smiled, despite the fact none of them could communicate with him. While working, Jason found out that only one other person in the entire village understood any English other than George and Marine. She was older- She was an older woman. She was an older woman named Medina and Jason discovered she was originally from Mexico before being transported to Ludus at 17 years old. She'd picked up some English from dealing with American tourists in her old life and practiced Earth languages... languages? And practiced Earth languages on Ludus when she had the time. He was impressed and sad at the same time. Ludus sucked. Jason met up with Henry again for supper, since people on Ludus usually ate two meals a day, not three. Henry had been helping the villagers corral the few animals and salvage whatever crops they could. He could tell Henry was constantly repeating, Earth, in his head the same way Jason was mentally chanting, Consciousness in space. They split up without talking much, and didn't meet up again until the next... They split up without talking much and didn't meet up again until the end of the day. Jason, Henry, George, and Marine all took a seat in George's cabin as the sun was setting. They had barely gotten the village ready to move out the next morning right before darkness fell. As Jason watched the three other people in the cabin nibble on some hard bread over a candle flame, he wondered if he looked as exhausted as everyone else did. George sighed. Ah, <sighs> man, this is a long day. Thank you for helping out, Chinas. You already saved our lives and pitched in when you didn't have to. Jason tiredly waved his hand. By this point, he knew China had nothing to do with the country and was part of George's half-remembered South African slang. 
As far as he was concerned, George had helped them so much in understanding the world and giving them a place to stay that he didn't owe them anything. They were even, at the very least. Seriously, there's no need to mention it. You swallowed the orbs? Jason and Henry looked at each other before Jason replied. Yes, we have. George sighed and said, I told you that I was one of them who... I told you that I was one of them who had one when he... I told you that I was one of them who had one when I came to Ludus. I told you that I was one of them who had one when I came to Ludus. Mine got stolen. I'm kind of jealous that tomorrow you'll be bonded. It was probably smart to use your orbs now instead of trying to sell them. People on this planet will kill for Dolos orbs. Henry said, That's what we thought too. I just wish we'd had more time to think about deciding. Jason quickly interrupted. Yeah, now we won't have to worry about anyone stealing them. That was close. They had already discussed earlier to let George and everyone else know as little as possible about their situation so they were sure what the er- Damn it. That's a long sentence. <sighs> they had already discussed or. They had already discussed earlier to let George and everyone else know as little as possible about their situation until they... <sighs> they had already discussed earlier to let George and everyone else know as little as possible about their situation until they were sure what the orbs had actually done. Jason knew Henry was tired and grouchy, but he could have punched his friend in frustration. Shut the hell up, Henry. Sorry. That should be... Shut the hell up, Henry! George could probably tell something had happened, but he looked confused and shrugged. See ya, yeah? Early morning. Then he retired to his room. Marine had already gone to bed. Jason thought sleep sounded like a good idea. The remaining candle on the table in the cabin's main room... Ah, damn it. The remaining candle on the table in the cabin's main room was about to go out, and he didn't want to use up any more of George's resources. He and Henry... He and Henry... He and Henry both fell into their simple beds in the guest room, and before Jason fell asleep, one last time, he thought... Consciousness. Space. As hard as he could. Here goes. Oh, man. Jason wasn't sure when he realized that he was dreaming, but when he did... He was in a burger restaurant he used to frequent during his college years. Sitting at the booth with him was a cartoon cat. Uh, he said. This is different? The cartoon cat nodded slightly, its grave bearing completely at odds with its goofy appearance. Yes, this is probably the first time you've had perfect consciousness while sleeping. I briefly considered appearing to you as Dolos, since his image is recent and distinct. But after I realized you considered him an enemy, I decided against it. The current image you see is a beloved character from your childhood. I considered it a safe choice. Well, this is definitely surreal and creepy. But yeah, I'd rather not see Dolos again. Jason grimaced and thought out loud. I guess I probably should hear you out. In fact, I doubt I have much of a choice, do I? Unfortunately, no. But you initiated my presence. You chose to swallow the orb. Wait, you're the orb? In a manner of speaking, yeah. Oh. In a manner of speaking, yeah. No, why did I why did I do that? In a manner of speaking, I am. I am the interface built into the orb you swallowed. My function is to provide you information, guidance, and let you choose your own development. I was activated when you swallowed the orb and chose your school of magic to... So many S's. So many S's. <laughs> I, was 
I was activated when you swallowed the orb and chose your school of magic to specialize in. Well, orb or not, I'm going to call you Eek. Also, this all sounds awfully elaborate. I thought other people that used orbs on this planet got random effects. In the past, they did. However, Dolos has started a new phase of his experiment. Several... St Several dozen orbs of my generation with functionality similar to my own were distributed... Uh, so many fucking S's. Several dozen orbs of my generation with functionality similar to my own were distributed to small number of... small to small numbers of the newest colonists to Ludus. Oh my god. Uh... uh. Several dozen orbs of my generation with functionality similar to my own were distributed to small numbers of the newest colonists to Ludus. The orbs you... The orbs? The orbs? The orbs used by you and your friend, Henry, are the last two orbs of this type that Dolos will send for some time. Okay. Why change things now? I can't answer for certain, but I believe Dolos has decided the planet's political and social climates are stagnant. As for what he's trying to accomplish, or what his actual experiments are, I can only speculate. The only thing that's certain is he is intending to create change. Okay, so more or less, you don't know any more than me right now. So moving to a different topic, I already chose my magic school, so what did you mean by choices? My function has been expanded from standard orbs. Lotus is the home world of a type of being called the Dew. Wild do generally correspond to one of the schools or subschools of magic you are aware of. Dolos utilizes do that have not taken any specific. Uh, oh my god, this is so hard. <clears throat> Dolos utilizes do that have not taken on any specific attributes yet to power the changes initiated by orbs such as myself. Jason thought he might understand. So, what you're saying is that in the past, orbs had a preset way to instruct the. Orbs had a preset way to instruct these do to affect the human host. You, on the other hand, have a bit more control over how these creatures do whatever they do. Also, I am officially creeped out that you are putting parasites in me. The do will attach to your soul and provide you with power in exchange for the ability to feed off your emotions and life energy. It's a symbiotic relationship. Also, the do cannot be forced to do anything. They are merely given a more attractive option than returning to the wild. Okay, that aside, how do my choices and advancement work? It is quite simple. In a moment, I will show you all the options you have to choose. In a moment, I will show you all the options you have to choose to use the power of the dew. In the future, you can gain more power and advance further by finding what mortals on Ludus call spirit stones. These are actually containers where Dolos has imprisoned sterile, neutral dew. Do I have to swallow these, too? If you wish to advance further in power, yes. Is there anything else you should tell me before I should... Is there anything else you should tell me before I start choosing powers? Just... 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 Just three things. Just three things. First... You will find that you will, uh, first, 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 you will find that you are a much more powerful mage than most others on Ludus. Ludus, ah, it's not. See, Ix, Ix lisp isn't that. It's not supposed to be that. Ba, bleh, not supposed to be that sloppy. <laughs> Should be more like this. It's just really hard to do when there's so many S's. Where to go? First. 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 That's hard. First. 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 First, you will find that you are a much more powerful mage than most others on Ludus. 
Orb-granted magic is usually stronger than what natural mages can produce. Second, you will have much stronger ability than more... Uh. <laughs> you won't get sued. There's no way to get sued. Second, you will have much stronger ability than normal with your magic's paired school. Last, when you choose abilities to use your accumulated dew, each ability costs different amounts of energy. Does that... designated... designated... designated in points. You may save any unused energy for your next... You may save any unused energy for your next advancements. So, this is like playing a role... <sighs> So, this is like a role-playing game. An RPG, then. I'm leveling up? For the first time, the cartoon cat looked uncomfortable. Dolos has apparently visited a... Dos... Dolos apparently visited a civilization eons ago that played games similar to those your generation plays on Terra. They left a deep impression on him. It is fair to say that he is gifted to you... It is fair to say that he has gifted you with more sophisticated orbs like me because your generation has the background to understand what is expected of you. Great. Just great. Okay, Eek, let's see what powers I can buy with my experience points. Jason could have been imagining things, but it looked like the cartoon cat was embarrassed. Oh. And that's the stream for today. Thanks so much for showing up, guys. That's three hours. Uh, um, I was going to do a stream tomorrow, but then I remembered tomorrow is Big Fat Turkey Day. So uh, I don't think anyone's going to show up. Um, I'm still, I still want to get some recording done before the next time I can stream. Uh, so I was thinking I wanted to start further on into the book. Um, like, keep recording without streaming for a while, and then start at a new, at a new spot in the story that, so you'll, you're gonna kind of miss some things, uh, unless you want to go buy Blaze's, um, uh, Kindle version of the book, but, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I wanted to start somewhere where there's more characters, too, uh, like, when they get to the city is probably a good, a good place to start when the, where the warehouse fire. So um I'm going to I'm I'm going to start on Tuesday 7 p.m. next this this coming Tuesday. Uh that'll be the next stream for this book. I uh, I'm going to I wish I could go again tomorrow. Um I'm really having a lot of fun with this book, but um so it'll be next Tuesday and remember there's also another uh uh requests only on Sunday at 5 p.m. So, uh, I, actually, I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be doing, uh, managing all these is, there we go. I'm going to be probably reading from the Divine series, uh, probably a couple of them. Hopefully, people will be sending in requests specifically from the series, because, you know, that's kind of like a, a review, uh, just because Extinction just came out, uh, the series is now complete. Um, and, uh, also, I just wanted to remind you guys, uh, that we got other life dreams as well. Um, the entire Selfless Hero trilogy, uh, that's all lit RPG, and it was, it was, it was my second exposure to the genre, but my favorite so far. Um, really fun, really hilarious series, uh, so glad to have... Uh, been chosen to narrate that and um, the reviews have been great sales have been amazing so um, go check it out if you haven't uh, if you haven't listened to it yet um, and also remember on the hit list was just finished and released last week um, uh, Timothy Dalton Sin's brother wrote it and it's first person and it's so funny it's I've, I haven't done a pure comedy like this before and it was just a blast. So, remember all these. Go buy them. Support authors and narrators. Ha ha ha. And uh, thank you so much for showing up to this 
stream. I really appreciate it, and hopefully I will see you Sunday and or Tuesday. Bye, everybody.